On today's episode, we'll be exchanging views on Eastern Ghouta bombing in Syria. Plus, we'll be discussing the 90th Academy Award Oscars 2018 and how it made history. And finally, we'll be bringing you the latest on some CSUF and local news. All this and more on today's episode of The Report. Welcome to The Report, Cal State Fullerton's premier source for news, views, and info. I'm Abby Fernandez. I'm Leslie Duarte. I'm Shannon McCurcher. And I'm Zach Slopemaker. Before we delve into our first hot topic, we'd like to invite you to become a part of the discussion this semester season. Click on the link in the caption of any of our report episodes to fill out a secure Google form with your opinion on any controversial issue we've talked about now or in the past. As many of these issues are reoccurring and evolving, ranging from gun control to abortion, climate change, or the state of politics right now. All we ask is that you please keep it civil. Let's move on to a topic that is getting international attention. According to BBC News, the Syrian war began long before it started. Many Syrians complained about high unemployment, widespread corruption, a lack of political freedom, and state of repression under President Bashar al-Assad. In Syria, there's a civil war going on, and the government is trying to defeat rebels by bombings and chemical weapons. Recently, the Syrian government targeted the rebel stronghold of eastern Ghouta outside of the capital of Damascus. The airstrikes had 674 Syrian civilians in 13 days. This is known as the deadliest attack yet and highly condemned by the United Nations. The Syrian civilians are dying every day and have been asking help for years. Thousands of families have been forced to take cover in basements or makeshift underground shelters due to the intensity of bombarding and shellings. Residents of Easter Ghouta said these shelters still do not give them security and safety. The war in Syria started in 2011 when initially peaceful protests were violently put down by the Syrian government. Up to date, the conflict has cost more than 500,000 lives. So ladies, I know there's a lot of moving parts here as far as the Syrian conflict goes, but I gotta ask the question, should the U.S. get involved, yes or no? Well, um, I think well, we already got involved, um, quite frankly, when we, you know, um, threw out the missiles last year in spring. Should we get involved more is, is I feel, the question here. What or how, when do we know to stop or how, when do we know to do more? I mean, that's kind of the conflict that, you know, is taking this nation. And, and there are pros and cons to both sides, right? I mean, this is, it's devastating what's happening. I don't know if you guys have seen some of the pictures of, you know, of Syria and the civilians there and the kids. It's really heartbreaking. So like you said, when do we step in? And I know the Trump administration um, is considering a new action plan after, and Trump said, quote, what Russia and Iran and Syria, Syria have done recently is humanitarian dis is a humanitarian disgrace what those three countries have done to people over a short time is a disgrace so he is now kind of on board with we we do need to come up with something because we know in the past he wasn't allowing refugees to come in our country right but now he's kind of like we need to come up with something else i think it's important but yeah. we have to figure out what's the right way to go in because there's a lot of finger pointing going on and a lot of accusations going across the board i have a, a quote here from president assad himself and he was being asked about the chemical attacks he said quote the only source is al-qaeda our impression that the West, mainly the U.S., is in hand and glove with the terrorists, they fabricated the whole story, story in order to have the pretext for the attack. The thing about this is that if we're going to go in, we have to make sure that we're going in with the right premise in mind. I don't think we should go in and side with anyone because we do have Russian at play. And, and essentially, this is this is sort of like the powder keg of what happened back in 1914 with Archduke Franz Ferdinand. You know, if we get involved in the wrong side and we stick with that side, we're going to end up with more bloodshed. We have to go in with something a bit more specific, I mean, like getting rid of the chemical attacks. We have to, we have to, we have to start talk to about World War III, right? We have because, right. That's what I'm really worried about. We have about. to talk about about that because foreign policy is a whole nother subject, something that for years has been discussed on what should America's stance be 
on aiding other countries. But right and now, how America's we stance was only to you wipe know, out ISIS specifically. Yeah, That's but in what, the past, right. America funded the rebels, and out of those rebels, ISIS was formed. That's something yeah. that people but don't now understand. That, that was I their think so. Yes, what I think I'm that trying it's to being, say it's is, super complicated. Is is the the bottom of it? If you see everything that's happening over there, it's it's beyond complicated. Alliances that don't make sense, alliances that last really short. I mean, it's just it's you can't keep up. Is is the thing, right? So it's like, how do we come in? Where do we yeah, come in through? We we have evidence that um, the Syrian government did in fact led out al-Qaeda leaders or, you know, ISIS leaders to add on to that whole thing. So, I mean, they, they yeah. this is complicated. And, and what I'm on. trying to say is the United States needs to really look at what is going on, not in a fact of what benefits us and what benefits the other countries, but about the kids. Yeah, there are kids crying out for help, saying we don't want to die. That is the problem here. I mean, the UN was funded by FDR. That was our thing. Why isn't the UN doing anything? Yeah, I mean, it, it, almost 700 civilians dead in the last 14 days on, on a poll that I had read. 185 of those being children and 109 of them being women. And it, it, we obviously know all these atrocities are horrible. And there's even allegations of, of mustard gas being used and chlorine gas being that's used. Horrible. And that's where I think we as America, which is part of the United Nations, Human. need to go yeah, in is if we don't go in, we don't need to send ground forces. We can send things from a distance without um, risking American lives. If we find weapons of mass destruction facilities or we know for a fact that there's these chemicals being used and we know where it's being manufactured and we have some of our drones way up in the sky, why not attack from a distance and take care of at least the chemical portions the of thing, this? The thing here real quick is because I, I keep hearing this and I'm sort of torn in between. And this is a, a tough thing. It's a very tough subject like all of the ones we, we have here. But it really... Um, you know, hits hits to heart for me because I have a lot of fam uh, military family, a lot. My brother is, my husband is retired, my brother-in-law, I mean, my father. I have all of these people and they're active right now. When we talk about what we can do, Yes, we're going to involve them because they are the U.S. It's not you and I. We're not in the military. We don't go out there. We're not going to go unless, of course, we take in, you know, people, whatever be the case. But we're not the ones up there. It's them. So it's, it's very easy for us to say, let's do this, let's do that. But then the thought behind me is like, I, I don't want my brother there. Like, it, yet, you know, it, it's devastating because I do see these pictures and it's... I, I, right. I, and to add to that, know, some people are like, well, you know, we can't. We can't be the world police. We can't sacrifice See, that's, our. That's I'm just saying I don't agree comes. with that. Foreign yeah, I'm changes, super torn too. But foreign I, policy changes well, over time. That's why to set the standard. The right, but I mean that's what. Do. That's as far as military, I don't think we need to send in military. I would. I am. Then how would we? How would we? Yeah. we got to a point. The UN's job was to. Form by I know, FDR. but it's bigger than that. Have have politicians? We don't need, I mean, we've got no point of technology that we don't that's, need to send people in to do a job. That's what the whole debate is, we, Should we send our military over there this to is fight? How that, are that you can't, you, you, you right. can't have anything done if you don't send in people. No, no, take no, no, not, no, 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 that's, no. Because it is such a complicated issue that we cannot just... Um, talk about war like it's nothing. This is huge, and we have to move I mean, on could to our next be, though, topic. The, um, the but, next world war, you know, that is why it's so crucial. This is something that has been debated for many years, and now, you know, we have to really just it's a tough rely subject, on the for UN, sure. for, for sure. sure. Yeah. For another time. Well, let's move on to the second hot topic. The 90th Academy Awards happened March 4th, and to make sure there were no mistakes this year, Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty opened a clearly marked Best Picture envelope crowning... The Shape of Water. Yes, The Shape of Water swept the Oscars with four awards this year, including Best Picture and Best Director to Guillermo del Toro. In his acceptance speech, the Mexican director shared his experience as an immigrant. By growing up in Mexico, I thought uh, if this could never happen, it happens. And I want to tell you, everyone that is dreaming of a parable, of using genre fantasy to tell the stories about the things that are real in the world today, you can do it. This is a door. Kick it open and come in. Thank you very much. For Best Supporting Role, Allison Janey won for I, Tonya, and Sam Rockwell won for Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. And for Best Actor in a Leading Role, Gary Oldman won for Darkest Hour. 
For Best Actress in a Leading Role, Frances McDormand won for Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. And as if we couldn't love her enough already, she had all the female nominees stand up, making it a very memorable feminist movement. The writers, the cinematographer, the, the composers, the songwriters, the, 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 the designers. <laughs> Come on. Three of the Harvey Weinstein accusers, Ashley Judd, Salma Hayek, and Annabella Sciorra, together presented a video montage on women and diversity. And of course, history was being made as Jordan Peele became the first black winner for Best Original Screenplay for Get Out. And the 89-year-old James Ivory took home Best Adapted Screenplay for Call Me By Your Name, making him the oldest Oscar winner ever. And Coco, an animated film set in Mexico and made largely by a Latino cast and crew, won Best Animated feature and best original song. So guys, a lot of diversity this year. And uh, I want to ask you, what did you think about that? And I want you to be specific because there was winners. I mean, there was movements. I want you to talk to me a little bit about um, McDormand. I want you to talk to me about what you thought was going on that night. You know, Tell me. I absolutely loved it because I was with my nephew and he watched um, Coco win an award and he doesn't know what the Oscars are, but Coco is his favorite movie. And that just brought me to tears to see my little nephew just be so excited that he was represented in the Latino culture and I mean throughout the Oscars night we saw a, a lot of diversity but that moment just really stood out to me that he gets to grow up in where Latino or Latino inspired culture movies are winning Oscars and that's beautiful to me. I, I agree I thought it was I, I loved the opening ceremony. The stage was gorgeous. But you know, this year, the ratings are the lowest they've ever been. And every year, they've been going down. And for some reason, I, I, I don't know why. Jimmy Kimmel, um, I don't know if you guys saw his opening monologue. He kind of touched a little bit about diversity. He said, quote, I remember a time when the major studios didn't believe a woman or a minority could open a superhero movie. And the reason I remember that time was because it was March of last year. So really in a Same. whole year, you know, the movie industry has just blown up with different. And, and they talked about also um, Black Panther. I mean, that was kind of the talk of the So we know who's going to take it next year. Yeah. Right, but right. But I think it's important to note that because... It, it has been. It's been a tremendous year. I mean, now uh, that makes me question, like, are they doing this because they feel bad? Is it, you know, and I feel like the winners also, too, might have a little bit of that, you know, random guilt of like, did I win this because I deserved it or because, you know, we're shifting all of this? So I don't know. Okay. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I certainly feel like it is a very... Um, drastic, you know, change as, from as last As someone year. who is a huge movie junkie, I, I feel like every movie that won, won completely yes. rightfully, yes. complete merit. There's no chance of politics being yep. involved. They talk a lot of the Oscars being entertainment-based, and that's all it is, but movies are politics. And the individuals Movies well. are politics, yeah. And, and the individuals are political figures, and they do ca carry political weight ex especially, you know? Every person that won in a category... I think is wonderful that each of them had something to say about something else. I mean, they had that, um, I can't remember his name, but he had a Native American uh, person come up and talk about uh, going into war and what it was like to fight for the country and how they're wonderfully represented in the, in the, um, the movies. I think it's important that every person that won in that, in that section had something to say politically about the world because that's how you impact people. You know, you know that's how you going, reach people. Going back to what you were saying, Abby, I think, you know, this isn't just made out of because they feel bad, but this is a great start. You know, people will not let the Oscars go back to what they were. You right. know, this is a step forward. And it does, it, I think, you know, Shape of Water did a great job. Guillermo del Toro, Coco, all these great movies get out. Great, oh great, God, great. I and I, I mean, there were no surprises really and to who was And what win. I really did love too were the fashion statements. Right now it's not who are you wearing, but why? What are you standing for? I mean, the colors this yeah. year, I did notice there was a lot of white. And I've okay. looked into it a lot, and, and you know how all, they were wearing all black at the... Um... Well, you know, they made it a point, the, the starters of the movement said, we, you know, we, we'll wear pins on the red carpet, but we don't want right. to drag it, out this movement throughout. Well, there we don't want to put a downer worn, on but, it. But, but this know? white movement, it was like, 
we're stepping for Hollywood is taking a stance and moving forward, not a forgetting slate. a clean slate from it. And I just yeah. thought that was awesome. Instead of, you know, all of them wearing black, they're like, you know what, we're going to wear white. There was bright colors. There were bows. That was super feminist. Um, well, so talking about, you know, the movement and Me Too and all that, um, I don't know if you guys noticed that Ryan Seacrest yes, didn't have a lot of people was, there. Yeah, and that was, uh, that was really hard to watch because I, this just happened, you know, and people were, people are taking action is my thing here. But what did you guys think about that? Really quick, I want you to tell me, I mean, how's this man feeling? Is, is this a fair thing? Taraji P. Henson really threw some shade at him on the red carpet, and there were a few people that did talk to him. I think the network knew what was coming, but because it's Ryan Seacrest, they still put him on the red carpet yeah. while they had Juliana I mean, at the but pool. He's so I mean, good at his job. You bad know, move on that. Sad. I mean, yeah. he has getting... accusations. I know, but are they true? It's a whole other yeah, thing here, guys. Yeah, Watch some other episodes. We've talked about that before. Gets into a lot. Now turning to national news. Since the murder of Blaze Bernstein in January and the revelation that his sexual orientation could have been the cause, lawmakers notice an inconsistency in current state law. Reporter Matthew Kessler has more on the story. Ever since the discovery that Blaze Bernstein's suspected murderer is linked to one of the nation's largest hate groups, authorities have questioned whether or not Bernstein was murdered due to his sexual orientation. According to documents obtained by ProPublica, Woodward attended paramilitary training with the hate group Adamwaffen Division, which is linked to multiple murders of gay young men around the country. Attempting to curb this awful trend is local lawmaker Janet Wynn, who has stepped up calling for harsher punishments for murders that are based on hate crime criteria. To find out what Titans think about this proposal, I hit the streets of Cal State Fullerton to ask them. So it's not fair to say that, oh, because you murdered that person who had a more difficult life, then, then it's like their life is worth more, so to speak. I think hate crime is should be enforced as a bigger penalty because it's not just murder, it's um, something on the reason that they were murdering, so I think it should be. It's murdering with a purpose. Yeah. I, I think murder is murder and should have a harsh penalty no matter what it's about. As you can tell, we have a mixture of opinion here on campus. For the report program, I'm Matthew Kessler. Is that a stab in the back we see? On March 1st, President Donald Trump announced that he planned to impose a 25% and 10% tariff on imports of steel and aluminum, respectively. This is an attempt to bring down the U.S. trade deficit. This move, however, may start a trade war with other countries, even with key key U.S. allies in response to Trump's new tariffs, Canada and the European Union are both threatening to retaliate against the U.S. Conservatives, including House Speaker Paul Ryan, criticized the idea. In response, Trump tweeted that a trade war could be good for the U.S. and easy to win. Feeling stressed and need help? Well, Cal State Fullerton's Counseling and Psychological Service will hold wellness workshops in March to address students' mental health needs. There will be a series of open seminars intended to anyone improve physical and mental well-being. There will also be a total of 18 workshops covering four topics throughout the month. Each of these topics will help any college student who feels stressed or needs help. The topics will be focusing on identifying and decreasing stress, improving sleep habits, understanding emotions, and learning how negative thoughts can be controlled. Hopefully these workshops can really benefit students who need it but aren't able to find help anywhere else. Take some time to chill and come check out the new renovated space Cal State Fullerton is offering you. Students can now walk from the quad to the Polek Library. That's right, no more walking around the entire building to get in. The extension of the library now has an entrance on the south side. The new location offers additional study spaces for students and has plenty of electrical outlets for your convenience, as well as modern furniture designed for work and relaxation. Jennifer Gerbatz and Amanda Vargas have more on this story. After years of closure, the south side entrance of the Pollock Library is open once again. The Pollock Library South closed down back in March 2014 after a 5.1 earthquake struck near the campus in the neighboring city of La Habra. The earthquake caused $6.5 million worth of damages, according to data from the Orange County Board of Supervisors. The first, fourth, fifth, and sixth floors of the south portion were closed down to repair ceiling and ventilation systems. Students, faculty, and staff were able to take in the colorful and inviting renovation of the first floor when it officially opened on February 22nd. The center features comfortable seating, perfect for socializing or studying, and there are also numerous electrical outlets, computers, a reading room, conference room, and a gender-neutral bathroom. The Center for Honors and Scholars, Titan Card, and Circulation Services are also on the first floor. One student shared his thoughts on the renovation. 
Like very um, casual, a lot of people. I like the way the chairs are like super modern looking. And the upper floors are expected to open in the next couple of years. For The Report, Amanda Vargas and Jennifer Grubouts. And well, that's all the time we have for today on The Report. I'm Abby Fernandez. I'm Leslie Duarte. I'm Shannon McCurcher. And I'm Zach Slotemaker. Stay fresh, Fullerton.